is there is there something you'd really sure. like to do? Oh yeah, so many things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me an idea of what of where you're where you well, might go. Uh, a lot of it goes back into history, and it's, I've had it on the boards for a long time, so long in fact that uh, people kind of do things like it for TV. So it kind of like it, it kind of you know, takes the steam out of it. It's not new anymore. You know, those things take a long time. So which one are you referring to that that, that has been done by TV? Is there a specific well, one? Yeah. Well, there's you know I had this whole Viking story, and then all of a sudden it's on the History Channel, and it's okay. But I'd love to see that. A Viking story? Yes. Yeah, you need somebody needs to see a really good one. Yes, yes. That it doesn't have to be that. I don't think that has the you, real. That has the true horror. Yes. Okay. That only Mel Gibson could deliver. Well, yeah. I mean, there's nothing scarier than a bunch of those guys coming to town. It's like, it's pretty scary. I would watch that. Yeah. Well, me too. I want to see that. I'll see it. We will see it. In December 2009, news broke that Hollywood actor and director Mel Gibson's next project was to be an as-yet untitled film about Vikings, starring Leonardo DiCaprio in the starring role as a Viking. It was to be the first time Gibson and DiCaprio had worked together, and the headlines announcing the news quickly made their way around the world to a response of anticipation, as most were receptive to what seemingly could prove to be a perfect cinematic fit. The project was scheduled to shoot in 2010 and enter post-production exactly one year later. Variety magazine reported that DiCaprio, who has long been fascinated by Viking culture, will play one in a storyline that will be as unsparring as Gibson's other period directing efforts, Braveheart from 1995, Passion of the Christ from 2004, and Apocalypto from 2006. Screenwriter William Monaghan was then announced as the would-be screenwriter of the project. Monaghan's previous credits include historical epic Kingdom of Heaven, the DiCaprio headlined The Departed and Body of Lies, and the Gibson thriller Edge of Darkness. Producer Graham King would say, This will be an awe-inspiring story, created with some of the industry's finest cinematic talent, and I'm just over the moon to be making this film with Mel, Leo, and Bill. Gibson would say at the time, The very first idea I ever had about making a film my first thought about ever being a filmmaker was when I was 16 years old and I wanted to make a Viking movie. And I wanted to make it in Old Norse, which I was studying at the time. It's odd, because at that age, that's a stupidly ridiculous idea, because how will I ever be a filmmaker? It's just some kind of romantic pipe dream. But that was the first big, epic, wacky idea I ever had, was to show Viking real. In English, the English that would have been spoken back then, and Old Norse whatever the 9th century had to offer. I'm going to give you real. I want a Viking to scare you. I don't want a Viking to say, I'm going to die with a sword in my hand. I don't want to hear that. It pulls the rug out from under you. I want to see somebody who I have never seen before speaking a low, guttural German who scares the living shit out of me coming up to my house. What's that like? What would that have been like? When asked if DiCaprio could pull off the role of a Viking, Gibson said, he'll be amazing. He's a great actor. DiCaprio confirmed the rumors during the press junket for Shutter Island, telling Britain's Channel 4 that, We don't know what the language is yet. Mel is developing a script right now. I hope it gets made because he's able to teleport into historical time periods unlike most directors I've seen. He's amazing at that. There are moments in Apocalypto when you really feel like you're on top of that pyramid watching a human sacrifice. He's like a historian in that way. I hope that movie gets made, and I hope I get to do it." DiCaprio would also tell MTV that, I always wanted to do a Viking movie. I'm a big history buff, and I don't think there's been a really fantastic Viking movie ever made. Those were some of the most barbaric people ever in history. I'd love to see Mel Gibson's version of that, because certainly with Apocalypto and some of the other films he's made, he's been able to transport me back in time unlike very many filmmakers have been able to. As the story gained traction, Gibson would say, We are going hammer and tongs on the script right now. When I was 16, learning about the history of the English language, I became fascinated with Vikings. And I imagined what they would sound like, how they would talk. And that's what I'll be going for in this film. It's a challenge, though. There's never been a good Viking film, not that I've seen. I think I've found the right way to get into it, though. But I don't want to say too much. The real problem is making those guys sympathetic. They were monsters. 
producer Graham King would speak of the preparations for the story's conception, saying, We all knew we wanted to do it. It was just a matter of finding what the story would be, who our Viking was. There's not many sympathetic Vikings out there, and you have to find something of sympathy in one of them, or what else is there to show, other than blood and guts and rape and pillaging. You can't just show a film that's battle scene after battle scene. You have to show heroism and sympathy. This is not going to be a cheap movie to make by any stretch of the imagination. We've got to make it interesting to a worldwide audience. To me, the greatest thing about this is we don't have a book or a familiar story. We had a couple of guys doing a month and a half of research on all of the different Viking stories that are out there. We had that research when we went in the room and we had Mel driving that train during the meeting. So we sat there five or six hours and then we had another meeting and it was the same thing. And after that, we felt we had a sufficient enough story and material to go off and write the script for a movie. When asked how the Viking flick compares to Marvel's film adaptation of Thor, the producer laughed and said, We're not making a comic book. This isn't about superheroes, although I'm sure everyone in town would love us to. This movie will be quite serious and very much for grown-ups. Another seven months would pass until in July 2010, an incident in Gibson's personal life would make the front page news around the world. American entertainment and gossip website Radar Online would publish excerpts from a series of secretly taped phone calls between Gibson and his ex-girlfriend, Oksana Grigorieva. The taped calls were leaked to the site from an unknown source. In the recordings, taking place during a complicated custodial legal battle with Grigorieva, Gibson was experiencing what would be fair to describe as a nervous breakdown. Gibson used an offensive racist term, he made various threats, he ranted, and spoke in a profane way that didn't portray him in a positive light at all. The tapes captured the rage of a man on a personal spiral. The story was speculated to bring an end to, if not Gibson's career, then certainly to his reputation. During the custody battle, he was accused of striking Grigorieva during a fight months earlier. Gibson pleaded no contest to a misdemeanor charge. He was sentenced to probation, counseling, and community service. Four years earlier, the star had been famously arrested in Malibu for drunk driving, and during the arrest, he was reported to have made a series of discriminatory and anti-Semitic comments. In a reflection of the incident, Gibson would say, I acted like a person completely out of control when I was arrested, and said things that I do not believe to be true and which are despicable. I am deeply ashamed of everything I said. Also, I take this opportunity to apologize to the deputies involved for my belligerent behavior. They have always been there for me in my community, and indeed, probably saved me from myself. I have battled with the disease of alcoholism for all of my adult life and profoundly regret my horrific relapse. Despite a number of high-profile calls for a boycott against Gibson from within the Hollywood studio system, Gibson seemed to have successfully put the situation behind him, to a degree at least, and would move on with his life and ongoing addiction treatments. The new leaked tapes, however, now threatened to completely derail Gibson's career and standing as an actor and filmmaker. In the immediate fallout, his manager left him. Agents and studio executives demanded Gibson never work in the industry again. ABC had previously dropped the Holocaust-themed miniseries that Gibson was developing with the network, and now his role in the then-in-production sequel to The Hangover was also taken away at the behest of members of the cast and crew. Gibson would describe the outburst against his ex-partner as the worst moment of my life. Imagine the worst moment you have ever had being recorded and broadcast to the world, and it wasn't meant to be public. You didn't stand on a soapbox and do it, but that's what happens. As the story spread around and the calls for cancellation grew louder, actor Leonardo DiCaprio would immediately distance himself from the upcoming Vikings project and effectively sever all ties between himself and any collaboration with Gibson. According to another exclusive published by Radar Online, the original source of the leaked tapes, when asked if he was still attached, DiCaprio had replied, not a chance. According to an alleged source, the Radar article went on to claim that the source close to DiCaprio said that the star, then promoting Inception, did not want to risk his reputation with being associated with Mel. Leo has earned the right to pick and choose who he works with, and Mel Gibson is not one of them, the alleged source added. 
The originally announced writer, William Monaghan, would also now publicly distance himself from the project. When asked was he still Gibson's screenwriter, he said, No, no. I don't know exactly what's happening with that, except it's not going on right now. I didn't write anything for it, and it never went past the announcement, I believe. Around this time, Gibson would speak at a screening of Mad Max. When asked by the audience during a Q&A about upcoming projects, he answered, I just got a second draft of something I'm really excited about today. It's a Viking thing. Vikings, as you know, are very unsympathetic characters, and these guys will be bad. I sort of hooked up again with Randall Wallace, who did the script on Braveheart. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's called Berserker. Questioned whether the Vikings will have horns on their hats, as is the typical stereotype, Gibson said, They did not have horns. No, I don't think they had horns. They're going to look real. I want to make something real and visceral. Randall Wallace, Oscar winner and regular Gibson collaborator, was also included in the pitch to would-be investors as an attached producer. It was the first reveal of the new screenwriter and of the script's title, and so gave us a glimpse as to the direction of the title characters. Berserkers, or Berserks, were champion Norse warriors who are primarily reported in Icelandic literature to have fought in a trance-like fury, a characteristic which later gave rise to the English word berserk. The majority of Vikings were farmers, hunters, and other working classes, and the minority were those who had dedicated their lives to Viking causes. These champions would often go into battle without mail coats. The word berserk meant going into battle wearing only bear pelts or other animal skins. Berserkers are attested to in numerous Old Norse sources. Viking berserkers worshipped bears, which were among the most powerful and wild animals back then. Bear symbolization presented the wildness, physical power, resilience toward any challenge in life. Many Viking enthusiasts believed that the berserkers made a sacrifice to the bear, and in return, they got the power as fierce as the bear. A berserker was a member of the unruly warrior gangs that worshipped Odin, the supreme Norse deity, and attached themselves to royal and noble courts as bodyguards and shock troops. The berserkers would have a pre-battle ceremony called Berserker Gang before they entered in a state of collective trance. In this state, they would howl like wolves, bite the enemy's shields, and kill everything in their way. Nordic warriors believed that, if they received blessings from Odin, they could acquire the berserker rage during an assault or raid on the enemy. If they were gifted the power of the bear's spirit, they believed they would become invincible berserkers in the battlefield. The berserkers would make up for their small numbers by launching well-planned surprise attacks that were vicious and effective. First striking from distance with the use of spears and flaming arrows, before advancing toward their opponents and engaging in combat, utilizing swords, axes, and sheer brute strength. The aim of the Berserker was simple and direct. Kill as many enemies as possible. The Berserkers also fought in brutal clashes at sea, mostly against pirates. The Vikings would bind two boats together and place a springboard on the bow. One Berserker would be launched from the boat to engage in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He would fight until he was killed. Then another berserker would be launched to take his place, and so on until the rival was eliminated. There would be mass fights, and retreat was not an option. There were the rare occasions when a man would show fear and dive into the sea to escape, and said deserter was then considered a dead man to his kin and brethren, and forbidden to ever return home. In the Norse sagas, they were often portrayed as villains. In an old Norse poem, most of which dates from the 9th century, Berserkers are recorded as the household guard of Norway's King Harald, who reigned from 872 until 930. It was said that the king's guards howled and fought in a frenzy of bloodshed and pure violence and were immune to attacks from their enemies, feeling no pain until the superhuman trance subsided, at which point the berserker would collapse to the ground. No plot synopsis for Gibson's film was revealed. We learn that they will speak the Norse language but the project was yet to receive any official green light. Gibson was then reported by the press in Ireland as having recently been spotted in Dublin on a scouting mission. He was pictured at the Shelbourne Hotel in Dublin, and during one of his days in Ireland, he helicoptered to the west, according to the Galway Tribune. 
It's common knowledge to any student of history that an intensive period of Viking settlement in Ireland began in the year 914 AD. Between 914 and 922, the Norse established Waterford, Cork, Dublin, Wexford, and Limerick. This suggested that Viking settlements may have had a Scandinavian elite, but with most of the inhabitants being indigenous Irish. Also worth noting, in 2008, a year before the initial announcement of the Viking project, Gibson had visited Iceland with his two sons. The event was widely reported by the Icelandic media as the filmmaker was seen visiting various areas of historical significance. It was later suggested the trip might have been a location scouting exercise for the movie, as historically, the Norwegian Vikings had arrived in Iceland in open Viking ships in the 9th century and settled on this cold volcanic island in the north. They persevered through unexpected volcanic eruptions, drift ice, and harsh winters, and the Icelanders, who inhabit Iceland now, are direct descendants of the Vikings. In 2012, during an online interview with ComingSoon.com, Gibson was asked, What's the status of the Viking movie, which is still called Berserker, I presume? Gibson replied, It's still called Berserker, and I believe it's going forward. I've talked to actors and stuff, but there are some good names attached who want to do it. But not DiCaprio? asked the interviewer. He's pretty busy, so no, came the reply. Is it still a violent Viking movie in the original language? he was asked. Not the original language. I thought about that at one time, but when you consider that English comes from the Middle English language, it's not a big jump. I'll do something that's understandable for a modern audience, but it won't be the English they're used to. I've got a great script, and the idea's been batting around in my head for years, and I couldn't find a way to make it work, because if you look at what Vikings did, they're pretty unsympathetic, and there's no point in doing Viking light. So I had to find a way to find devices and ways to make that work dramatically, intelligently, and make it seem realistic, so it's about real conflict in a real era in the 9th century, so that you actually see behavior and a new mode of thought seeping in. By the 11th century, there weren't any of these guys left anymore. With regards to the subject of budget and investment, Gibson would say, Everything's expensive. It's ridiculous. But I can't talk budget. There's some interest and they dig it, but it isn't the entire vision. You can't write the vision down. You can only have a blueprint and then go from a jumping off spot. But it was by accident that I bumped into Randall Wallace and we're collaborating on the script. We've got a fourth draft and it's great. All we've got to do is do it now. In the aftermath of the 2010 controversy, Gibson laid low. Taking the starring role in the film The Edge of Darkness and acting in the offbeat drama The Beaver, Gibson retreated to his church. A devout member of a traditionalist Catholic group, he would build a church in Malibu where services are all in Latin. He spent time praying, went to therapy twice a week, focused on his role as a father, underwent rigorous rehabilitation and attending counseling sessions. Then in 2017, Gibson would emerge from a seemingly Hollywood-imposed exile to direct his first movie in over a decade, the well-received epic Hacksaw Ridge. Telling the true story of Desmond T. Doss, played by Andrew Garfield, who won the Congressional Medal of Honor despite refusing to bear arms during World War II on religious grounds. Doss was drafted and ostracized by fellow soldiers for his pacifist stance, but went on to earn respect and adoration for his bravery, selflessness, and compassion after he risked his life without firing a shot to save 75 men in the Battle of Okinawa. The film was seen as a return to form for a largely quiet Gibson who commented on his previous negative publicity, saying, The past 10 years have been interesting. I don't feel like this is some kind of a comeback for me. I just feel like it's good. But I was always busy during that time, and I was always writing and developing stuff. Traditionally, people have not been too willing to back the things that I wanted to generate, so I used to put my hand in my pocket and do it myself. But nothing has happened in that arena for a long time because I wasn't willing to take the risk. As time seems to be healing old wounds, people still hold their own opinions on the personal events that severely impacted Gibson's professional life, and the argument of artist versus art is one that never ends. My own personal opinion is this. Gibson's pedigree as a filmmaker is in no doubt. Apocalypto remains a thrilling masterpiece, and in my top 10 films of all time, 
which to me only made the thoughts of a Gibson-directed Viking epic all that more enticing. The reason for the project falling apart, however, are simply sad. As for the man's private life, personal demons, and indiscretions, as Gibson himself admits, he's had a fierce, lifelong struggle with sobriety and alcoholism. Does alcoholism excuse a person's behavior and conduct? Not really. But does alcoholism explain a person's behavior? I think so, yeah. As anyone who has ever dealt personally with the problem or cared for someone who has, they'll tell you that a person in the grip of inebriation doesn't mean what they say, let alone even remember saying it. It isn't considered the hardest addiction in the world to beat for nothing. Anyone unfamiliar with this hell may be quick to judge. Anyone with actual knowledge of it wouldn't judge at all. It strips a person of dignity, functionality, stability, health, and coherence. It creates a whole new character, a self-destructive and unrecognizable one that didn't exist in a previously sober mind. It's a condition that doesn't show remorse or pity. It doesn't go away or let up until the afflicted makes a mighty effort and show of will to address the issues both mentally and physically. As of 2021, Gibson is more than a decade sober, crediting 12 steps with helping him on his path to inner peace. Gibson would discuss sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous, saying, They call it the spiritual path for the psychopath. They say there's only three options. You go insane, you die, or you quit. That's the harsh reality. I'm an old hand at that. The answer's not in a bottle. It's not in a prescription med or any of that sort of stuff. Some people need to use that stuff. I don't. But it's a higher thing. You have to get some kind of philosophical, spiritual level to deal with the knocks. We've all got troubles. All the time, every day, in some form or another. That's life. It's how you deal with them. You can't let them get to you too much. I have a sense of ease, I think, which is good. Because you've got to be good to yourself, right? If you're not good to yourself, it's not going to radiate onto anyone else. As things stand, Mel Gibson's Berserker is still an unmade screenplay and sadly seems destined to remain so. And so concludes the unfortunate series of events that would see Mel Gibson's boyhood dream of making the greatest on-screen Viking saga of all time remaining unrealized. However, there's still a complete script. There's still time. Mel has a vision and he's the kind of guy to make things happen, even in the face of adversity. So. Who knows what the future holds for Berserker? Thanks for watching.